What's going on, peeps? And do you ever feel like your life is like a video game? Well, Ronnie Radke of the controversial rock band Falling in Reverse seems to think so. A band name that seems to be in reference to moving forward. If you don't already know, Radke started the band when he was in prison, so he wanted to push on from those days and attempt to avoid other obstacles on this path to where he wants to be in life, like a video game. Jokes aside, the rock band has been fairly successful in their own right, and has had some impressive longevity, I'd say. They certainly haven't been forgotten, that's for sure. For good and bad reasons which is why I think this group would be a perfect contender for my series, The Appeal. This series is dedicated to covering controversial or divisive musical acts and creators to find out why people enjoy them as much as they do. Last time I talked about AGR, who were certainly divisive, but I'd say Falling in Reverse and especially Ronnie Radke himself are controversial. It's my task to give out an unbiased opinion on their pretty short catalog for a group spanning about two decades. I had only heard their infamous hits like Game Over, Good Girls, Bad Guys, Watch the World Burn before I did this deep dive due to my good friend Brad Tasty Music making jokes about them. Now due to Ronnie's recent abuse of the copyright system, I'm going to be careful about what I say that might be a bit too negative. Thankfully this is a video about positivity until the last section, so I should be fine. With that being said, I've listened to every Falling in Reverse project and song as well as Ronnie Radke's bewildering solo mixtape. I mean interesting, incredible solo mixtape. Don't hurt me Radke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's time to press play and uncover the appeal of falling in reverse. Ronald Joseph Radke was born on December 15, 1983. He is one of three siblings with brothers Anthony and Matthew. Now, Radke's mother struggled with drug abuse and was absent during his childhood. His father also had addiction problems, so he had a pretty rough upbringing. Through all of this, he began to create music. Radke would begin to learn how to play the piano and a guitar, initially covering Blink-182 songs. He formed multiple bands in high school. After running away from home to join a band, Three with his friend Mitch, which he described as sounding like Blink-182. Radke lived with Mitch and Mitch's mother for a while. They played shows at various venues in Las Vegas before Radke moved back in with his father, briefly attended school, and eventually dropped out due to a lack of focus. Radke's second band was called Lefty, where he met Max Green, forming the band True Story, which eventually evolved into Escape the Fate. Radke was inspired by the rock band Trice, leading to a transition from screaming to singing, contributing to the formation of Escape the Fate. He was a part of the group from 2004 to 2008. Brian Money sought for a vocalist in 2004, leading Max to recommend Radke. The band gained prominence after winning a radio contest judged by My Chemical Romance and signed with Epitaph Records in early 2006. They would then record the EP There Is No Symphony for the Dead and the debut album Dying is Your Latest Fashion. Just when everything was working out, it all came crashing down. In 2006 that same year, the lead vocalist was involved in an incident in Las Vegas where his friend fatally shot 18-year-old Michael Cook in self-defense during an altercation. Radke, though not the shooter, faced charges related to possessing brass knuckles at the scene. These charges, combined with Radke's history of drug issues and rehab, resulted in five years probation. Following a probation violation in 2008, Radke served a two-year prison sentence. At that time, he was the lead singer of Escape the Fate, but after this news, he was ousted from the band during his incarceration. Upon his release in 2010, Radke formed a new band initially called From Behind These Walls, later renamed Falling in Reverse due to copyright issues. It was a band of Radke's pals beforehand, they visited him in High Desert State Prison, but couldn't actually be a band until he was released. Their debut album The Drug in Me Is You was released in 2011. He called it a breakup album, not in relation to a girl, but his old band. Radke in various interviews discussed his strained relationship with Escape the Fate members and the band's alleged misrepresentation of him. They obviously saw him as a murderer, even if he didn't do it. Having a clean image is important for business. They start making up lies, he's addicted to heroin, in prison, he got caught with heroin, fuck him, go suck his dick to like 13 year old children while on stage. 
They're telling these kids, you know, fuck the old singer. He just got caught with heroin. He's going to be in there for a long ass time. This next song is called Situations and then go sing my song. This was a part of Ronnie's first interview, which was about as unhinged as you'd expect. Now their debut album consisted of songs written by Radke during his prison term. And the album received mixed reviews, but sold well, reaching number 19 on the Billboard 200, selling 18,000 copies, eventually being certified gold. Falling in Reverse continued with various lineup changes, releasing their second album, Fashionably Late, in 2013. We'll talk about these albums more in depth later, let's just say this one was quite an experiment with elements of rap and electronics. This one got a lot more negative reviews this time, yet it sold even more than their debut. 20,000 copies, in fact. Further experiments from Radke took place on his own solo mixtape, Watch Me, the same year. The band went through more changes, including the departure of longtime guitarist Jackie Vincent, in 2015, and the release of their third album, Just Like You, that same year. This one was seen as a lot more tolerable, returning to their metalcore sound. In 2016, the band began working on a new album called Coming Home, which was then released in 2017. This is their latest album that is a lot more clean and focused than their previous records, having elements of space rock. It was their lowest performing album, though, peaking within the top 30. During this time, Radke took on guitar duties for the band, and their drummer, Ryan Seaman departed, and this includes a unfortunate tragedy for the band. The untimely death of guitarist Derek Jones in 2019 led to the release of the single Popular Monster later that year. It was a rap metal song, which we'll see a lot more from here. This single went on to become their most successful release to date, with 300 million streams on Spotify due to its widespread use on TikTok. It's their only song to be certified platinum. It's multi-platinum, actually. The band continued to evolve in non-album singles, and apparently Apparently got a new release, Neon Zombie EP, expecting in 2024. The rollout has been going on for like nearly two years now, but all the singles have performed very well, including Watch the World Burn becoming their first song to reach the Billboard Hot 100 at 83. Zombified also went gold. For the first time in the band's career, they were actually getting regular airplay on rock stations. Their focus on singles has certainly grown their fan base more than anyone expected. Most punk bands had fallen off the earth by this time. I don't want to go down. I don't want to disappear into the abyss of aging emo. There's a lot of bands that have done that. So I looked to rap, like Drake, and I was like, what are they doing? And they're putting out singles. They just drop a single. Pop artists drop singles. And I'm like, okay, so what if I just put all my creativity into one song instead of putting all my creativity to 10 songs and being rushed to get it out. Your creativity starts spreading out over 10 songs. If you put it all into one song, it's really good. And then you put all your creativity into a music video and it worked. Falling in Reverse remains active with ongoing performances and new releases. Radke also built a Twitch audience with over 200,000 followers. Now that they've built up a solid following within this new generation of music listeners, maybe they'll put out that fifth album at one point. Best you must agree, I got that white boy swagger rapping right down to a T. I got my hand up. As mentioned in their revolutionary song, Rolling Stone, their lead vocalist Ronnie Radke has that white boy swagger. What does this mean exactly? When you look back at all the top white boys throughout the years, such as Justin Bieber, Eminem, and me, what do they all have in common? Besides their skin color, they are all charismatic, confident, and convincing. Radke definitely checks off all those boxes more than you want to admit. You can say all you want about the man. He's certainly certainly isn't boring. Still still the lyrical content this man comes up with, especially on his early records, is just borderline insane, but you can't deny it's entertaining. White boy on the beat rocking Gucci sneaks, all I do is win, Charlie Sheen. It gets better. Sexy girl, I just fell in love. You should really try it. It's a hell of a drug. Like, oh my god, you can make me come, come, complete. He was really horny on that song for some reason. Then there's, as a matter of fact, let's cut to the chase. Gonna take that spot on the top of the list quick. Call it statutory r Okay, sometimes he goes over the line, gets his Kanye on, if you will. Now, you may be wondering why I bring up these obviously stupid, absolutely terrible lines, because unlike most musical acts, I think that Ronnie Radke buys into everything he says. I don't think he's joking around or trying to make some sort of gimmick. He writes all of his songs, so this isn't some boardroom written publishing. No boardroom would approve of these lines. That's why it's so convincing. Radke's inner white boy swagger shines through 
through with. I can believe that he believes in everything he says, whether he thinks he's the so-called king of the music scene on Tragic Magic, he even doubles down a decade later on losing my life, now he believes he is the god of the music scene. There's this whole fictional world in his head. He is the main character, of course. His life is truly a video game. So it's no question that his fans eat this stuff up, whether they just think it's funny or actually worship Ronnie Radke as the goat of music. If anything, the man has got a good stage presence. When this man is rapping, it sounds like something out of the Hamilton soundtrack. He's confident and charismatic. He can be singing, shouting, outright screaming his lungs out as they do in metal. I don't think this man holds back in the slightest. There's this raw passion and energy to his performances. While his writing can be questionable, the dude can still write a good hook. Tragic magic gives away their secret in plain sight, tragedy into melodies over catchy beats. The band has a great way of putting together generally catchy melodies that are smooth and casual to the average listener. Let's just say, don't listen to the lyrics, which is crazy, I know, but game over will be stuck in your head for the rest of the day, I'm telling you. That pre-chorus on Bad Girls Club? Very well done. The melody on Pick Up the Phone? Oh my gosh, clever earworms that later turn into guilty pleasures. There's a lot of songs where you hate the lyrics, the message sucks, but the melody, man. It's catchy like Want You Back by Cher Lloyd, you know, terrible lyrics, amazing everything else. Some people just like a song that is a little risque and bad boyish because Radke isn't a hero. He outright admits he's a bad boy. Just look at good girls, bad boys. This song takes in the fact that Many boys wonder why girls risk their lives to hang out with these so-called bad boys, but the twist is that Ronnie is the bad boy. He almost feels guilty about himself that he gets so much action from these good girls when he's obviously just using them for sex. This dude knows he's a piece of shit. He isn't trying to justify it. He may act the way he does in the end. He still finds a way to get with hot chicks. Radke is literally dating my childhood crush Paige who wrestled in the WWE. How does he do it? His white boy swagger is just too hard to resist. He sees himself as a sick doctor on I'm not a vampire, better watch your daughter. The free seas man, charismatic, convincing, and confident. It's a deadly combo. There's a reason this band has fans, man. It's hard not to want to watch what this man does next. Because what this band does is certainly ambitious. Their first record, The Drug and Me Is You, doesn't take a lot of production risk. Caught Like a Fly is certainly a standout in terms of sound. Kind of sounds like circus music, to be honest. But between the good riffs and catchy, tragic, magic melodies, it's hard not to like songs like the title track in The Westerner. I think the instrumentation they typically have is pretty damn quality. The other members of the band actually kind of go crazy. The next album, Fashionably Late, is where the wrists truly make way, though. The dated synth on Bad Girls Club that that ends up getting drowned out by the guitars and drums. A sample of the bridge from Girlfriend by Avril Lavigne? The random dubstep drop on Rolling Stone, which is followed by a key change? <laughs> Each section of that song was different from the previous, I swear. Radke was throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. Alone seemed to be an EDM rock song where the bridge was like his own version of Bad Girls by M.I.A. You see what I mean? Gotta say, the bridges on this album are like otherworldly. A world where Game Over is the theme song for every video game you play. The only place you'd see a Charlie Bit Me reference, which was dated even in 2013. This sounded like a reason to hate them, but I'm almost impressed about how much they throw at the wall and just run with it. It's an impressively bad album, and I gotta give them their props. Listen to it, you'll be shocked by what you hear. I can see why a specific crowd gravitated towards it. There's not a lot like it. They may have gotten too ambitious, leading to them slightly backpedaling on Just Like You. 
This was an improvement leading back to the pop punk metal style from their debut with glimpses of Radke's white boy swagger. You could tell he was being held back this time though. On their latest album Coming Home, which as I said before has a spacey vibe, is different from everything they've ever done. So colored me shocked when I was in for a real surprise visiting this album for the first time. Because this record is actually good, I'm serious. I've been very negative on their past three records, but I would actually defend this one. It's their most ambitious record yet. Mainly because it sounds mature. The production is refined and focused. Ronnie isn't doing anything stupid with his vocals. His writing isn't nearly as goofy or off kilter as usual. They really took this one seriously. Just based off the title track, the buzzing simps that fit in with this spacey vibe so perfectly. Radke's singing is passionate even without all the weird quirks he usually has. The piano is combined with the drums and guitars. It all works on a production standpoint. This is the first fall in reverse song I actually love. I don't listen to a lot of metal, but I will say I'm getting slight like star set and bring me to the horizon vibes from all of this. The song is about coming home to his daughter. Wait, this is so wholesome. What? Superhero might be a game over sequel we never thought we'd get. He's trying hard to beat the stage, but realizes he has no business being the superhero as he knows he can't save the world. He can't even save himself. Radke will never save the girl. All the doubts that pile on him are just too much. He somehow needs to do better to improve himself. I don't mind as a point of realization for Radke that he hasn't been seeing his daughter a lot due to his music ventures similar to how his mother abandoned him for long periods. He throws his hands up and accepts his fate, not caring if he wins or loses as a parent. He's sadly becoming his own mother. The last track of departure is a request to be set free and say goodbye to the person he's become. Looks like he needs a savior. I can't believe how much better this is in comparison to like everything they've put out. Falling in reverse truly lived up to their potential in coming home. I feel proud of them, genuinely. This was actually good. Ronnie threw away all the bullshit and made something that stuck. Sure, it was technically not as interesting or creative as Fashionably Late, but this is by far their best sounding record, even if it was similar sounding throughout making a few tracks fade into each other. Overall, it has Radke's most mature lyricism and vocals, as well as the band's best production ever, backed by a space rock vibe. Their ambition is certainly admirable. While the execution isn't always great, I can safely say that they have... Pushing aside all the white trash and other questionable topics, I think Fall in Reverse has moments of good intentions with their catalog. One of the biggest songs they have is The Drug in Me Is You. It's a straightforward punk song about yourself being your worst enemy sometimes. Pretty relatable. This serves as a realization for Radke, I believe. I'm the problem, it's me. As cringe as it comes off on good girls, bad guys, it's certainly relatable to a specific audience. It's a shame that these good girls decide to go after bad guys that use them. At least don't mess with Ouija boards gives the listener a good warning. The band definitely cares about their audience, motivating them with songs like Champion and Born to Lead, which encourages people to be a leader and not a follower. Keep Holding On is a rare traditional ballad from the band, encouraging people to not give up and keep holding on to their lives. There is much more ahead. Radke honestly seems surprised he's lasted this long himself. He also seems to relate to his audience who struggles with similar issues of depression and anxiety. If feels like a message to the fans. You know, towards the end, it feels more fulfilling. Drifter seems more pop rock inspired, trading the metal guitars for a softer sound. Radke gives up, realizing that he'll always be alone. Could this be a callback to that EDM rock track in the first half? He feels like he's a drifter as he's never seemed to have a regular home, even growing up. He didn't have a normal family due to his father's addiction problems and his mother's abandonment. This resulted in him becoming an addict, obviously, which his father is clearly upset by. His father tries to help, but Ronnie just tells him the only person that can help himself is himself at this point. By the end, he admits he misses his mother. Cemented by Mama Radke showing up to one of his acoustic concerts in 2013 where Ronnie seemed to forgive her. What a good ending to that album. Each record ends on a good note to be honest. On the third record, there's the first piano driven track I've heard from them called Brother. No, it's not the same Brother track as on Watch Me. We'll get to that in a bit. His brother was Anthony Radke who died in a motorcycle accident. He mourns his death, regretting missing those phone calls, never saying his last goodbye. This one's actually pretty good, can't lie. It was a better Better way of expressing his emotions. Also, God If You Are Above is a more religiously focused track where he questions his fate when his death day comes, heaven or hell. It's a question that I feel like most faith-based people wonder. Did I live the way I could and should? 
I've sung my praises on coming home. A few other tracks I'll highlight are Broken that continues in this mature direction bringing together everyone around the world, being broken but having hope for the future. Straight to Hell opens up with him stating that he can't be your savior, he's a mortal man, he's no Jesus. The message seems to be Radke questioning people that are opposed to him, wondering if they were to cast a spell, would they send Radke to Hell? Radke would do that to his enemies I bet. I've found a few great messages in some of their standalone singles too. Their biggest streaming giant for example. Popular monster is the voice inside your head hoping you'll pay attention. It is the narrative of a hero who has been wrongfully accused and demolished by society. It demonstrates what occurs when you are pushed too far. You transform into a monster they want you to be. Voices in my head must be a follow up to that single where these voices are just now telling him he's on the verge of death. Nobody's listening to him on the outside. They think he's just fine. Maybe that's true and he's just being anxious. This is called hypochondria. He's obsessed with the idea that he has some sort of chronic illness that he doesn't know about. I'm sure these messages have helped out their fans through tough times in one way or another. Maybe the less serious songs are made to give them a much needed laugh. I'm quite impressed with how Falling in Reverse can bend their sound. The group is fairly versatile, especially nowadays. Fall in Reverse can be deemed as a metal, emo, or pop punk band based on the surface. But if you look more into the music, there are elements of electronica, orchestra, and of course hip hop. I'd say The Drug and Me is You and Just Like You are the more focused pop punk albums whereas the Fashion Be Late shows off their willingness to experiment. Stemming from Radke's hip hop influences such as Eminem and Lords of Brooklyn, this is where the man combines rap with metal. Going through this album, there are times where each section can be completely different from the other, like on Rolling Stone. You'll get a sweet riff, then a section of Radke screaming, and then Radke rapping. You could also witness a beat drop, key change, mass shooter skit, the possibilities are limitless. Basically, you'll never know what to expect going into their record sometimes. There's little things that make you sit back and have you question everything. To make it a bit more bearable, there's going to be a catchy hook to bring the track back each time. Radke has described their music as sounding like Norma Jean or Under Oath with Katy Perry-like choruses. It could be sunshine and rainbows like on Bad Girl Clubs, or balls to the walls like on Pick Up the Phone. Speaking of those earlier releases, they've been putting out remakes of songs from their debut album that are more stripped back and orchestra piano ballad focus. It's definitely more gentle than the original piece. On the flip side, Radke will bring out his alter negro. I'm not even kidding, he said that. He decides to push the band aside for his own vision on Watch Me. This is a 2013 mixtape he put out that contains several tracks of him rapping over boom bap or other Eminem inspired instrumentals. He later returned to this side of himself during the current standalone singles era they're having. You'll get a trap metal fusion featuring Corey Taylor from Slipknot on drugs, as well as Radke hopping into aggressive, fierce triple time flows and watch the world burn. Their discography is quite the roller coaster. There's highs and lows, but at the end of the day, you can say at least he had fun. They don't hold back. The man always has a lot on his mind, those voices in his head leading to him spitting out his feelings without restrictions. He'll bring up his 2005 arrest, the problems he had with his old band, his 2012 abuse scandal, and other feuds with the media. His fan base admires Radke's honesty and ability to speak on whatever he has on his mind, knowing the consequences his comments could face. Let's go through some of these references. Raised by Wolves seems to be a clear reference to being abandoned by Escape the Fate. It was the band he founded and felt like they disregarded him like he didn't matter. He claims he's the reason they're as big as they are. Then he vows that they will never reach the fame they once did. Based on album sales of both bands, he might have had a point. Tragic Magic makes reference to his 2005 overdose on a mix of heroin and cocaine, as well as an evil ghost who many may assume is Mr. Craig Mabbitt. I'm Not a Vampire touches on his drug addiction that he blames on his father for making him listen to Black Sabbath. I didn't realize how much of a bad influence they had on people until I looked it up. Wow. Pick up the phone is low-key psychotic. 
Radke is pretty paranoid of a girl cheating on him because she won't pick up. To the point where he's got a gun in his hand, uh oh. Then the second verse comes along after they had a rough fight where he tells her to lie to the police saying she slipped. This better be the end of this clearly toxic relationship. Then there's don't mess with Ouija boards. And here's the thing, Radke is comparing himself to that spirit that the board would summon. It's some sort of revival after being kicked out of his old band. Now that he's back, he wants revenge. He feels like he has a choice between sinking or swimming on Sink or Swim due to escape the fate abandoning him at sea. Rondi obviously is going to choose to swim and survive even if he struggles to. Maybe his life is like a video game. Call Like a Fly is about escape the fate bandmate Max Green obviously. He's thrown out all the shots here. He's going to sleep with his wife, brings up him getting beat by his dad, and that Ronnie is just like him, a drug addict. It's Over When It's Over is also directed at Max Green, telling him to take back all the pot shots the band threw at him and wants them to admit the beef is over. He also disses Craig again for trying to impersonate Radke's style. Fuck You From Coming Home seems to be about ex-member Ryan Seaman feeling the band is better off without him. The most dangerous person is someone who has nothing to lose. Ronnie is so honest about his experiences for a reason. He can be a bit too honest sometimes. I'm letting you know she liked up my posts on Facebook? Wow, Radke the Rizzler, am I right? The title track of Fashion Me Late is basically him making fun of his own adultery during his girlfriend's pregnancy. Can't tell if he's sorry or not. He lets everything fly and watch me though. Radke starts off the record by being an asshole. <laughs> he pieced together the live broadcast reporting his 2006 arrest. The first verse is about his toxic relationships with women. Then the second talks about the rock scene sounding the same. And the third is him discussing a theory of his girlfriend setting him up after he accused Ronnie of beating her. Plus, he he decided to become a mass shooter bid song. The track ends with him saying, this is a joke, huh? The standalones can get pretty unhinged too. The two losing tracks are a bit tame. Losing My Life delves into his struggle with his fame and past actions. He feels like he's more hated than Donald Trump. The track has a few skits involving Radke reflecting on his life, falling into a deep slumber, so long that his daughter was now a grown up. Losing My Mind features Radke being stressed about not being ready to change or choose the next step in his life. It takes a toll on his mental health. On the other hand, Watch the World Burn and Zombify certainly open up a can of worms. Zombify is more of a criticism on cancel culture, feeling like someone is getting their life ruined by a comment they made 10 years ago, and he sees this as laughable. He believes the plan is for everyone to not voice their own opinions anymore and just follow the norm, zombifying the new generation. If you're on the left, you'll probably hate this. If you're on the right, it's probably more of an anthem for you. Watch the World Burn takes shots at more sensitive people and his enemies in the music industry. He claims he has serious dirt on people that act like he doesn't know where one singular post will make them all fall like dominoes. With a reputation as damaged as Radke, this could get ugly as the man already has nothing to lose. There's a reason people back him up. Here's some other reasons though. may be somewhat parasocial, but I've listened to Ronnie since I was like 12? Now, being 21, I chose to play his songs with my friends while I had my first drinks and was even gifted a vintage Falling in Reverse band tee. I think people cringe out at the songs a lot, but one, I think they're just fun to listen to, but two, his songs were a product of their era. He can be pretty volatile, but whenever I'm listening to his songs, there's a childish freedom I feel in it, and it's really rejuvenating. The answer is simple for me. The music is really good. The musicality be behind the reimagined songs, the genre combination he has, the extremely high production value for both the audio and the music videos, etc. Say what you want about Ronnie, agree or disagree with his opinions and politics, you cannot deny his extreme talent. Plus, I've never met the guy, but if you disagree with his point of view on stuff, I've heard he's extremely genuine. He is who he is and doesn't compromise that for anything or anyone. You respect him, he respects you. We need more people like that. I became a fan of Ronnie back in the Escape the Fate days when I was like 12. Him and Max Green were pretty huge idols for me, lol. His voice was just so special to me and the music was my gateway into metal. It was easily digestible. Me and a buddy will still put on Dying in Julia's Fashion on car rides and we still know all the lines. That album holds such a dear spot in my heart, so much 
teenage angst in one album. Nowadays, it's pretty much only Ronnie's voice that keeps me around, and I don't feel like Falling in Reverse does anything really special. But it's music I can put on in my car and my non-metal listening girlfriend can enjoy it too. It's fun, catchy music, sometimes a little cringe, especially on the first album. I don't listen to a lot of this type of music anymore. My interest drifted into more extreme metal and electronic. So if Ronnie didn't sing that damn good, I probably wouldn't be listening along. Ronnie's versatility, creativity, and energy. He's not afraid to take risks. All the different genres and different types of songs allow you to listen to them at any time, regardless of what you're feeling. They have great songs for working out. They have songs that make you laugh, songs that make you cry, etc. They just have great songwriting production, particularly in the last five to six years, and they put money into their music videos, which I appreciate a lot. Ronnie is incredibly musically vocally talented. The music he makes has just the right mix of beautiful melodies that can be sung along with powerful guttural screams that make you feel the song in your bones. I don't know any other band that mixes pop rock and metal elements as well as they do. Ronnie himself is an asshole, <laughs> lol, but he admits it. We know it, he knows it, and he owns it. Been a fan since Escape the Fate. Him going to prison was crazy, and at least for my generation, it was the first time something like that had happened with one of our bands. Then all the drama that went on while he was in prison with Escape the Fate just made people more eager to see what happened when he got out. I remember the phone call interview he did from prison where he talked about making a band from behind these walls was the name at the time, while he was in prison and all the lies his ex-friends and bands had told on him. Whether it was intentional or not, Ronnie had always had the gift to make people listen, and knowing this guy was making songs with no instruments, sounding out the bass and drums in a prison cell was nuts. When Fall in Reverse was unleashed on the scene and nearly every song was a catchy yet detailed lyrical story of how his best friends wronged him, it felt different. Ronnie has always been ahead of the curve with things, and I think the largely teenage audience that listened to Who Dying Is Your Latest Fashion just latched onto that album and it became dear to us all. Yeah, the lyrics are mostly cheesy, it's dated, but one amazing thing is despite the cheese and the outdated feel, Ronnie is constantly on the move, setting new trends, and changing up the sound in a way that has aged perfectly with his fan base. Plenty of people hate him, but every one person that hates him, there are three that adore him, and his authenticity, even if that authenticity is him being an asshole. He sells out arenas for a reason. He knows how to put asses in seats and keep people entertained. Okay, time to get toxic. Falling in Reverse's material is certainly not my thing. Based on their poor reception from music nerds and critics, it's safe to say a lot of people agree with me on my overall thoughts. I don't hate them as much as others do. Once again, I like Coming Home. If I was to make good albums by bands I don't like, that would be there. The first thing that puts me off is Radke's voice. Ronnie Radke contains that whiny and monotone pop punk singing style that I've seen plenty of bands do. I'm guessing Blink-182 started that trend. Almost British sounding when it comes to pronouncing words differently. It's pretty dramatic and low-key funny. There's a reason this singing style gets made fun of a lot. Now that I think about it, Radke always brings up that he feels like he is his worst enemy, which summarizes my thoughts on their catalog. Ignoring the corny lyrics, the only thing I really don't like are his vocals. He he leans too hard on the pop punk accent to the point where it's hard to take anything seriously. Meanwhile, everything around him from the slamming drums and rattling guitars brings the firepower. When he cuts the crap, it sounds a lot more listenable. He's able to cut loose effectively without the stupid accent. I've seen it dozens of times. The passion is there. It's respectable even. I do think these guys have talent. I just wish it was executed better. So I'm mixed on the singing. As for the rapping, I just think he tries a little too hard. A lot of the criticism criticisms that Eminem will get is that he definitely has the impressive ability of spitting syllables at a rapid pace, but just because he's rapping fast doesn't mean he's saying anything of quality. This is the case for Ronnie as well. About to go Darf, about to go Disney, into the darkness, into affinity? It sounds like if AGR was to make a rap song. Can't forget about, I'm getting kicks out of this shit like it was my sneakers, and the game fears me like a motherfucking wife beater. Speaking of wife beaters, Champion has got something similar as I've brought up before, Ain't giving it back when I take that back. As a matter of fact, let's cut to the chase. Gonna take that spot on the top of the list quick. Call it statutory. Look, man, let's finally just watch me in detail. Stupid Boy sounds like a big Barbie song. If you know, you know. 
I got your bitch sending flicks to me naked. The rest of the track is him pulling shit out of his ass. He might compete with Encore Eminem when it comes to pure randomness. My hatred for woman growing bigger with each day that I'm living. That's some bars right there. You know, Rodney can usually put together a listenable hook. So what happened with Never the Same? I guess he followed Eminem's formula too well. Also, these songs are too long for their own good. The features don't do a whole lot to stick out. Until Brother happens. You know, when Brad made this one of his sound bites, I thought it was Ronnie screaming it. Turns out it's some random dude named Danny. It's wild how it goes from Ronnie talking about his brother to I lost my way again sucks because it's clearly trying to be a motivational anthem about pushing past family tragedies. It's hard to take seriously, which sums up this entire experiment. So their catalog is mainly Ronnie Radke performing in a bizarre way and throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall to see what works. Sometimes it gets so bad to the point that the band's usual good riffs can't even save this. This is especially the case on Fashionably Late. Obviously this messiness is a big reason some people don't entirely vibe with the band. They also just aren't taking that seriously anyway with Game Over and Good Girl girls bad boys being mocked for their silliness. Like most metal bands, the group has also ticked off religious people time to time, whether it's the satanic imagery or specific lines that dismiss the possibility of a higher power. Radke doubled down in 2015 where he condemned religion for its treatment of LGBT people, claiming that it felt bitter and saw it be hypocritical in fact that Christianity was initially discriminating towards gay people but later grew accepting of them. Now this is what he said in 2015 and it seems like he's kind of gone the opposite where nowadays Radke has seemed to have turned on the LGBT community a bit. More specifically, transgenders. The same people that call me a womanizer, abuser, and a bigot are the same people that support the ideology that trans can have periods and support tampon companies making trans a spokesperson. It's extremely offensive to all women to mock their biology. Stop pretending this is okay. This statement led to him being banned from TikTok. A fan responded to him on Twitter about his comments about trans identity and Radke said, Cool, I identify as a black man. Do I get my reparations now? I don't know if he's being edgy or a troll and doesn't actually believe what he says. Either way, the man has now ticked off religious people, black people, and the LGBT community. Who's next? Well, Radke isn't afraid to talk about his past actions, which includes domestic abuse, throwing three microphone stands at the audience at the end of a concert, involvement in a street brawl that led to a murder, and a allegation. With all these allegations out on the internet, it's pretty easy to see why people wouldn't like Radke or his band. Now, he was never found guilty of his alleged abusive behavior, and he wasn't the one who pulled the trigger in that murder. A bad reputation is a bad reputation. That's just how life is. Once you're under fire for something that serious, it'll dwindle over your life forever. My goodness, I had too much to say about this. I just hope that if you're a fan of Falling in Reverse, you're able to respect my opinion. My intention wasn't to drive you away from this group. It was to find out why people like the band. Through this journey, I've found several solid reasons, including Radke's white boy swagger that lights up the track with confidence and provides great entertainment. It's also important to mention their ambition to experiment and their versatility, as well as the good intentions they have with their art and their outspokenness on whatever they have on their mind. This deep dive has made me appreciate them for what they bring to the table, even if I'm not a big fan of most of their stuff. I'm still not sure about Radke as a person. He just needs to sell down. I doubt he'll listen, but that's just my advice. If he somehow manages to see this video, which could be more possible than I think, I hope you understand my criticism and appreciate my efforts to find the best elements of your catalog. This was my unbiased review. If you enjoyed this video and want more just like it, check out more episodes of The Appeal. Please subscribe and like the video. I worked pretty hard on it. <laughs> I think it's my longest video ever at this point. Make sure to love all, and I guess this is game over. Peace. <laughs>